afternoon. Can you hear me okay? <clears throat> I think I lost my voice in the flight. All right, my name is Erica Fuchs. I am a former compensated gestational carrier. I'm also a faculty at the University of Texas Medical Branch, but today I'm going to be talking about my experiences, a little bit of my research, and um, how things worked for me, and I was a carrier in Minnesota at the time. I want to list my conflicts of interest because I'm an academic. I have intellectual personal uh, biases and I've been sponsored to attend today. So who am I? I'm the married mom of three kids, 16, six and almost two. Um, I'm a social and behavioral epidemiologist in maternal and child health. And I delivered twins as a gestational carrier in June of 2006, it's been a while. The goal in the U.S. for compensated surrogacy, of course, is for all parties to be legally empowered and protected. And this is really important because the ultimate goal is to have a healthy outcome for the gestational carrier and the resultant children. I sometimes feel like the carrier is left out of this a little bit with the um, supreme focus on the well-being of the child. So what are the steps and requirements? Well, there's basic requirements that are listed by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and SART. The um, gestational carrier should be between 21 and 45, be raising one of her kids at least, um, have had one term uncomplicated pregnancy, ideally being done having her own children. That wasn't the case for me, but I didn't know at the time. Life happens. Um, in a stable environment, and she should be financially secure. She will then go through psychological screening, some interview and testing with a qualified mental health professional. Hopefully they have experience um, dealing with fertility and fertility. Go through medical screening and then she will enter the matching process and the legal process and sometimes those steps are mixed up a little bit. So my experience here, I fit the basic age and financial requirements. I then had a psychological screening with a PhD licensed marriage and family therapist. I had an interview with her um, in person for about two hours, I think. And then I took the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, the longest exam, except for my dissertation. Um, I had medical screening, a records review of my previous pregnancy and delivery, and many, many lab tests and invasive tests as well. Everything to ensure the lowest risk of adverse events. This is for the gestational carrier, for the babies, and of course, an intended parent wants a good womb, right? So the benefits of using an agency um, in the US, private businesses can help facilitate the process. Some of the things that these agencies do are schedule screenings, facilitate with the matching process, assist with legal representation for one party, usually the intended parent or parents, coordinate travel and reimbursement, um, and support the gestational care and intended parent or parents in communication and mediation when things come up. In a previous study that I conducted, 71% of gestational carriers used an agency in their uh, most recent gestational carrier arrangement. My experience with an agency, which was Steve's, so full disclosure, extremely easy, and um, the matching process was facilitated via phone because this was 2006. We didn't have texting or video chat. Screening travel, hotels, and reimbursements were all handled. I rarely had to pay anything out of pocket. I think I was telling somebody earlier today, the only thing I recall paying out of pocket were cab rides from the airport to the hotel. So some of the matching preferences that people might um, look at when they are entering uh, as being a gestational carrier, the type of uh, intended parent that they're interested in, do they want to work with a couple, hetero, gay, single person or some other arrangement. They might have religious preferences. Some people wanna um, work with somebody who is their same religion or lack thereof. They might want to work with a domestic or international couple. Um, as far as compensated surrogacy go goes, it's usually an escrow process. Sometimes people wanna talk ahead of time about the relationship that is desired from the end of this agreement. Some people wanna have a really close relationship with the intended parent or parents, and some people wanna have more of a hands-off relationship and have it be a little bit more of a professional relationship. And then of course, talking about termination of pregnancy is really important ahead of time, and hopefully everybody discusses that. <clears throat> some of the other matching preferences um, the desired communication frequency, which I already mentioned, diet or exercise preferences. Some intended parents really want 
Um, a woman who has a specific diet or is willing to have a specific diet during her pregnancy. These aren't really things that are legislated so much, but you know, might be talked about or discussed during that matching process. Birthing preferences. Some women really want to give birth at home or in a birthing center. Some intended parents aren't into that or vice versa. Pumping and breastfeeding is a really hot topic in this area as well. Some parents really want their babies to have breast milk for the first few days or weeks. Um, whether a single or dual embryo transfer will occur is important and the number of attempts that they may be willing to go through. So if you agree on all of these, congratulations. So the legal experiences, as has already has been talked about by the other speakers, it varies widely by state um, from prohibition of compensated gestational care or arrangements to pre-birth orders. Minnesota was in between, which doesn't prohibit, but didn't have any case law. Um, Steve already talked about this. My case was a single intended parent. And so once my rights were removed, um, there was no mother to be added to that birth certificate afterwards. There's a great map of the state laws on the Creative Family Connections website. So other important legal considerations, reimbursement or compensation, how much? Insurance coverage for health and life, which is necessary in the US. Um, establishment of parentage, how that'll work. Again, multiple embryo transfer, if you're willing to undergo that or not. And then uh, talking about termination or reduction in what kind of circumstances that will occur. There are risks of multiple gestation. Uh, the top five risks are preterm birth, low birth weight, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, and cesarean section. In the previous study that I did, the percentage of carriers with multiple births was 35%, which is 10 times higher than um, the population overall. But this is actually half as much as it was in the early 2000s. So single embryo transfers have gotten much more popular, and so therefore the uh, multiple birth rate has gone down substantially. So again, termination agreements cannot be enforced, so the woman still has autonomy over that choice regardless of what they talk about or agree about prior to the pregnancy occurring. So my experience, I was 22 years old when I became pregnant as a gestational carrier. I had one child that I was raising. Um, I did a frozen dual embryo transfer, which failed, and then a dual fresh embryo transfer that resulted in twins. So in the mid 2000s, it was still really common to do dual embryo transfer. My delivery experience was very easy. Twins were born a little bit early, but they were very healthy. Um, I put my conversion up there for you uh, kilogram users. Um, the intended parent was able to attend their birth, which was really great. Um, and I delivered in a large metropolitan area in the Minneapolis area of Minnesota. But at the time, it was still kind of unusual for them to be dealing with this, but everything went very well. So in my uh, case, there were three major necessities that made it very easy for me. I had a supportive family, I had financial security, and a lot of backup childcare, which was very needed, especially um, at delivery time. So some difficulties that I uh, incurred during the process, life kept happening, so things come up. My mom was diagnosed with terminal cancer during my surrogate pregnancy, so that was difficult. Um, attending court during recovery can be tough. Um, I was sick during one of my court appearances, but I did make it there. So having to go to court, you know, three days after you have a baby, not the most comfortable experience. So here's a picture of me, one of the babies. I used an emoji to uh, protect the baby's privacy, but uh, they're 13 years old now, so I don't think you'd recognize them. Um, Babies spent, I think, 12 days in the nursery. They were not in the NICU at all. And I just got back to my usual life, going to school and parenting. So in, ha in hindsight, the things that I found very important for me personally was screening is very important for everybody's protection and well-being. I really think that's important. Um, agency support made the process super easy. I mean, a lot of people do these things independently, but I was too lazy for that. So um, agency support was great. Legal contracts are important for when things go right or wrong. And without interpersonal support, stability, the process could be very stressful. So that's it. You can ask me invasive or non-invasive questions at the uh, question period. Thank you.